Uh, so first, I'll acknowledge my collaborators. That experiment like this doesn't happen without a ton of work by many people. Uh, Chime is mainly a collaboration between these four institutions, uh, UBC, DRAO, UT, and McGill. Uh, so as everyone here uh, probably knows, uh, neutral hydrogen uh, emits at rest frame wavelength 21 centimeters. And by observing this emission at different uh, directions in the sky and with different observed wavelengths, you can make a 3D map of the universe using the redshift as the radial coordinate. Uh, when people think about 21 centimeter intensity mapping, they often think about the epoch of reionization where the main anisotropy comes from order one fluctuations in the ionization fraction. Uh, but Chime measures um, 21 centimeter anisotropy in a different redshift or wavelength range. So at low redshifts, the universe is mostly ionized, but some neutral hydrogen survives since if you have a dense cloud, the ionization rate uh, is proportional to the density and the um, recombination rate is proportional to the density squared. Uh, so a dense cloud can self-shield and a little bit of neutral hydrogen is left in the low redshift universe. Uh, the signal to noise uh, at the, for measuring 21 centimeter fluctuations at the epoch of reionization and at say chime redshifts is about the same. The signal is weaker at low redshifts, but the foregrounds are also smaller. Uh, and so by, by mapping out these fluctuations, you get a 3D map of the cosmological density field. Individual systems are not resolved by the chime beam, but as cosmologists, we're not attached to the idea that we have to measure individual systems or comfortable, everyone here is comfortable measuring modes of a random field with statistical noise. Uh, the main science goal of chime is to try to measure the BAO uh, feature um, at, in, at radio wavelengths and map out the expansion history of the universe. Uh, I'll show a few slides with the hardware. Uh, uh, so um, Chime has no moving parts. These cylinders just sit on the ground and the sky is scanned by Earth rotation. Uh, we measure redshifts 0.8 through 2.5. Uh, the full instrument is about 100 meters on a side uh, and will have 1,024 feeds. Uh, we have a pathfinder. This is under construction and should be finished over the winter. Uh, there's a pathfinder instrument uh, which is running that is one-eighth the collecting area of the full instrument. Uh, so Chime is what's called an FX correlator. There are two data processing stages. One where the, f where the electric fields measured uh, along the telescope are channelized in frequency and then handed off so that each frequency is independently spatially correlated down the cylinders. Um, I'll just briefly walk through these stages. So the primary beam of the instrument is this uh, narrow strip on the sky. That's the primary beam of the cylinder. As the Earth rotates, we scan. So we measure uh, about half the sky. Uh, each one of these uh, feeds going down the middle uh, is uh, transmitting analog measurements of the electric field at the antenna location. Uh, this channelizer is taking each of those measurements and channelizing it into 1024 um, frequency subbands with one over 1024 the times the um, sampling speed so that we channelize each of these antennas into 1024 time streams. Uh, those are transposed and go to the GPU correlator. So each, each uh, GPU in this correlator receives um, one frequency channel at all antenna locations. And then we just compute all correlations. So we compute the 2n by 2n covariance matrix of the feeds, which is what's called the visibility matrix. And uh, if you're not used to interferometry, then let me just uh, make the comment that the information in that matrix is equivalent to having order a thousand synthetic beams on the sky with a fully polarized measurement of all four Stokes parameters in the beam. So the idea is that by delaying, assigning appropriate delays in software to the feeds, you can synthesize a beam anywhere in the sky so that the signal interferes constructively. Just like if you had a focusing telescope, you would achieve the same um, constructive interference with physical delays. Uh, okay. Uh, the slow data products from Chime, like the cosmological, um, beams uh, go to disk for uh, analysis, you know, on a big supercomputer later. But some of our, some interesting aspects of Chime need to happen in real time because the data rate is too large. So, th uh, for example, the fast radio burst search, which I think is very interesting. I'll show a slide about it. Uh, fast radio bursts have very narrow, um, uh, are, very, are very narrow in time and also are highly dispersed so that you need high um, frequency resolution. <coughs> Uh, so the uh, data rate for that search is about a petabyte of data to per day, which is way too large to think about saving and post-processing. So you 
are in this regime where you have to do the analysis in real time. If you don't find it when it's buffered in memory, it's like gone and you can, it's as if you never took the data. Uh, okay, so um, the forecast from Chime, if the foreground removal goes uh, smoothly, these, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so these error bars do assume, uh, do include foreground uncertainty. Uh, <laughs> So they're not totally crazy. Uh, the time pathfinder is an interesting dark energy uh, experiment on par. The BIO measurements will be comparable to like current constraints. Um, and uh, full time, you know, was like a stage four dark energy experiment uh, on par with experiments like LSSP uh, or Euclid. Um, I'll show one slide. I'm personally working on this. It's not cosmology, but I just think it's super interesting. Uh, so there have been. Um, about 10 of these fast radio bursts found. The slide is out of date. There have been about 10 found so far. Uh, here's a fast radio burst. A, pul a narrow pulse comes in, delayed in frequency with the delay proportional to wavelength squared. And the coefficient of that delay is the dispersion measure, and it's telling you about the column density of free electrons through the um, burst. Uh, these observed dispersion measures are too large to be the uh, ISM from our galaxy by about a factor of 10. Uh, and if the excess is, um, IGM then uh, from outside our galaxy, then the bursts would be at cosmological distances. And no one, if that's the case, no one knows what they are yet. Uh, so uh, this is kind of a current, you know, hot topic in, in um, radio astronomy or in astrophysics. Uh, and full time has the sensitivity to find about 10 of these per day. Uh, so when that search is running, and we really just need to write, on the Pathfinder, the only obstacle really is just writing a bunch of software. Uh, then uh, we could answer just about any question you would you could you would want to ask about these bursts and maybe even use them as cosmological tracers. Uh, yeah, so our synthesized beam is about a third of a degree, so we could localize them that well right away. Uh, if we can post-process if baseband data, then we can improve that by a factor of the signal to noise. So twenty sigma bursts could be localized to an arc minute. Uh, if uh, anyone ever VLBI is a fast radio burst, if say three telescope, well, if you uh, if if you have three instruments that all observe it and dump their write their data to disk, then you can do offline VLBI later. Uh, and um, uh, well, no, it's no different from. I mean, the three instruments have to be staring in the same spot. Uh, if you have a lot of bandwidth, then since these are spectrally smooth. Um, then you can break degeneracy, degeneracies and localize them very well. So if you could, at VLBI, you should be able to pin them down to the get. Um, the actual uh, search can be very fast, say a few seconds after the burst arrives in the lowest frequency channel. You're probably thinking about real-time alerts. Uh, the challenge there is going to be, if you're going to send out real-time alerts, then uh, you, no one's going to listen to them if you have, say, a thousand false positives from RFI for every real event. And uh, we currently don't know how to achieve that in software with a delay of a few seconds. Right. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Um, I mean, it seems likely to me on physical grounds that the radio would lag the optical. But if you have something, like and if we're really finding like tens of thousands of these, and you have an instrument like, say, LSST that measures 10 square degrees in the sky, then there's some scope for like accidental uh, follow up where time just happens. That's right, yeah. Um, oh, I'm not sure about Hyrax. I know that it's happening, but I don't know the details. Um, oh, yeah, it's software defined. You just define as many frequency channels as you want. We define a thousand redshift slices between 0.8 and 2.5, but you could define more.
Um, oh, well, you just measure the dispersion rate. You don't know. I can tell you how many electrons. Uh, oh, the error. Okay, the error on the dispersion measure, the number of free electrons between uh, us and the source is really tiny. Um, but uh, translating that to a redshift is hard. Um, for one thing, the, the rest fast radio bursts, if they are cosmological, happen it happen inside a host galaxy that has its own contribution to dispersion measure and stuff like that. Um, uh, I, we wouldn't. We wouldn't. Yeah, we wouldn't. We wouldn't be able to narrow it down to an individual galaxy. We could maybe do an R prime of something. Um, well, we don't get a redshift. You could get down to an arc minute with localization afterwards if you had the base band. Um, anyway, maybe we should talk about it afterwards. But um, okay. Uh, um, oh no, you're thinking of another class of event called the peritons. <laughs> so uh, this was a long-standing puzzle, but it turns out there's more than one way to turn off a microwave. And uh, if you probably uh, if you just press the door open bo button without turn without the pressing the power button, then you get a periton. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, foregrounds. Uh, so the <laughs> this is our main problem. Of course, there are other problems like RFI, but they really like pale in comparison to the foreground separation problem. Uh, the foregrounds are large. The cosmological signal is of order, say, 100 micro-K, and the foregrounds are hundreds of Kelvin in the galactic plane and tens of Kelvin um, outside the plane. Uh, but spectrally smooth, they're synchrotron, which is a smooth electron distribution convolved with a smooth kernel. Uh, and so the cosmological fluctuations do dominate on short um, wavelengths in the radial direction. So naively, what you want to do is just high-pass filter the data, but that's um, that's difficult because the beam is frequency dependent. Uh, it's diffractive. So if you think about a frequency dependent, a beam that varies with frequency, and a spectrally smooth, so, uh, say, point source, then you get extra spectral variation as your beam changes with frequency and this wanders in and out of the lobes of the beam. Um, there was a very nice paper by Richard Shaw and collaborators in the Chime, collab in the, in the Chime collaboration, in the context of Chime showing that if you have a perfectly characterized instrument, uh, then you can, um, they figured out how to make, with a lot of linear algebra tricks, how to do an optimal separation of foregrounds and signal, uh, and you lose very little. You just lose the modes with low k parallel and, ar and uh, arbitrary k perpendicular. Um, but this assumes a perfect instrument, and uh, if the instrument is imperfectly characterized, we know from simulations that the calibration requirement is about 1%, and the beam modeling requirement is about 0.1%, which is this latter target is very hard. Uh, and so I personally would speculate that we will end up with some combination of this optimal linear algebra-based approach and other, I other ideas in the literature for uh, filtering suboptimally. Uh, but you know, suboptimal means that you throw away more information than you strictly need to, but you also uh, can get away with characterizing your instrument uh, less perfectly. Uh, so some combination of, you know, if you're familiar with the foreground wedge or its visibility space counterpart, delay space filtering, okay, then uh, some combination of these ideas uh, is, is likely what we'll end up with, but we're still in the early stages of uh, exploring. Um, and the last few slides, I'm going to speculate about the future. So uh, Chime modern radio telescopes are mostly a, gi a gigantic computer. Uh, some numbers just to show the humongousness of this calculation. Uh, so the total bandwidth of Chime, the total rate, data rate through the system, is 6.4 uh, terabits per second. Uh, the global internet, by comparison, is 250. So we're processing like a few percent of the global internet in this little like hut in British Columbia, which is kind of, <laughs> kind of insane. Uh, uh, the correlator, nominally, if you just naively estimated with floating point arithmetic, would be seven petaflops, which would appear to make Chime be the world's fifth most powerful supercomputer. Uh, it's really less than that because we use like bit packing tricks where the computer thinks it's adding one pair of high precision numbers, but it's really pa adding many low precision numbers. Um, 
the uh, reduced data that we you know, ship off to um, a cluster to analyze later is tens of terabytes per day, which is sort of the most you could really imagine dealing with. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge our um, most powerful collaborator, which is Moore's Law, uh, which is just the statement that these key pr computing parameters um, increase exponentially with a characteristic time scale of around 24 months. Uh, and so people have been talking about building an instrument like this for a long time, but it's just recently become possible, at least cheaply, uh, just due to these improvements in commodity hardware. We use gaming GPUs. We don't even use the GPUs that are supposed to be for scientific computing. Uh, the fact that you can get very cheap 10 gigabit Ethernet cards is like totally critical. Uh, cheap antennas driven by like, you know, the cell phone industry. Uh, um, I don't know the number in <laughs> the... Uh, the number in <laughs> the number in watts is on the order of hundreds of kilowatts. I don't know the number in dollars, but it's a significant contributor to the budget. Um, no, no, if you added up the, 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 the computing capacity of all the graphics cards, it would be less than that. Um, it's hundreds of kilowatts. So, um, so we've just re it's just recently become possible to build this sort of instrument. Uh, I would like to emphasize that the 21 centimeter cosmological power spectrum, the auto in autocorrelation, hasn't been detected yet. So in that sense, the field is sort of you know in its infancy. Say it's like the CMB pre-COBE, uh, but we're hoping to go all the way to a stage four dark energy experiment with chimes. So it's sort of like going from if the CMB went from pre-COBE to Planck in like one experiment. Uh, and uh, that's just because of Moore's Law. Like Moore's Law suddenly catches up and you can build this huge thing. Um, if it works well, uh, which is to say if the foreground removal works well, I think, uh, then the cost of scaling up is uh, really cheap. Uh, that's why I think this uh, program is so interesting. So if you want to increase collecting area, then uh, a given component of the experiment might, might increase proportionally to A. Like if you want to add more telescope, if you want to add more cylinders, the cost, of course, is just proportional to the collecting area. Uh, and other parts uh, scale, like for example, if you want to scale up the correlator, uh, that scales like A with an exponential Moore's Law suppression. So you can just keep doubling the size of the correlator every two years, or doubling the computing capacity of the correlator at fixed costs. Uh, so everything, there's a log A here, there should be a log A here, but that's small. Um, uh, so this is much um, better scaling in A uh, than, um, you know, say an optical telescope, if you want to double the collecting area of an optical telescope, it's much more expensive than just one power of A. Uh, so I would argue that this, if it works, is the most scalable way to measure large scale structure modes. Mo many cosmological parameters, the, the statistical errors are just mode counting. Modes are kind of the currency of, co of cosmology. And uh, if 21 centimeter works, then I think it will be the best way to measure more, uh, more modes cheaply. Uh, it's also possible to measure a huge volume. You can just keep going down to lower frequencies. Um, you know, you could imagine people people ima talk about measuring the the, the uh, epoch of reionization, measuring the dark ages before that. Even it's very challenging, but it's possible to you know think about doing that with a huge instrument. Um, so uh, there's no. It's not like galaxies where you run out at some point. You can just keep uh, mapping you know huge huge areas of sky and going out to very high redshift. Uh, there's also no real cutoff in the power spectrum like the CMB. There's um, the nonlinear scale, but you can go out to high redshift. There's the gene scale, but that's really tiny. Uh, so it's like 10 to the 6 times smaller than Hubble. Uh, so there's really uh, like no fundamental limit on the number of modes that you might potentially measure. There's just the scaling as one power of the collecting area or better. Um, um,
oh yeah, so the ISM, the ID, all the combined. Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. I have not really thought about that, but there must be some, uh, that is, I guess, only in the angular direction, right? Doesn't change the frequency. But uh, uh, right. Oh, they're also spectrally smooth. They're also spectrally smooth if you have a ra if you have a radio point source or synchrotron emission from another galaxy. It's also spectrally smooth. Um, I mean, you do it does mean that you have to reject spectrally smooth foregrounds at arbitrarily short uh, angular wavelengths. Um, okay, uh, so um, I'm over time. So. Uh, I was gonna put in a few slides that to make this have something to do with galaxy bias, but uh, maybe uh, maybe I'll just stop here and I'm happy to uh, to uh, answer questions during the break. Uh, I I personally think that this is really exciting because people have been talking about doing it for a long time and we're really doing it. And if it works, we can just scale up incredibly cheaply and incredibly fast. So I think it's a really